The title of today's sermon is Walking on Water. And I am sure that all of you have had to deal with some sort of corny icebreaker question in one group setting or another. It could have been a class, a meeting at work, perhaps a team building workshop. You ran into questions like, tell us two truths and a lie about yourself, and we'll guess which one's the lie. Or what is one of your guilty pleasures? Who is the most famous person you've ever met? But I'm going to ask you to think about one here for a moment. And that is, if you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? Anybody choosing invisibility? Super strength? Flying? Are there any Aquaman fans here who chose the ability to swim really fast and talk to sea creatures? How many of you chose walking on water? Imagine the interviews at the Justice League and Superman asks you, how is walking on water going to help our abilities to stop crime? Of all the powers that Jesus could have demonstrated, walking on water seems a little bit off, at least to us today. But as you always should when you read the Bible, you should consider the time. And let's think for a moment about what walking on water would have meant to those disciples. In that day, people did not swim for recreation. There were not pools in their backyards. In fact, there are many experts who would argue that even the fishermen that were in that boat, as Jesus approached, would likely not be able to swim. After all, even a great swimmer was likely to drown that day if their boat went down. So we have a boat full of people, many if not all would have been unable to swim, watching the son of a carpenter, who definitely would have no business swimming, not just swimming, but walking on top of the water. They were more likely to think that they were being approached by a ghost or some sort of demon than to think that Jesus was actually approaching them. And that is why they were afraid. And what is crazy is that it came right after the feeding of 5,000 people with just a few loaves and fishes. Never mind the rest of the miracles that they would have seen at this point. And yes, let's agree that feeding 5,000 in that situation is absolutely a miracle, even if you are one of the people who believes that there's a reasonable explanation, such as people added to the baskets as they were passed around. If you are one of those people who looks for that reasonable explanation, you should go back to the last sermon I gave here and check that out. But even so, imagine getting 5,000 strangers to share with each other and tell me that's not a miracle. And miracles are what we have come to symbolize the perfection of Jesus. So much so that it has invaded our language to this very day. Think about it. When was the last time you heard, and most likely in a derogatory term, well, I guess they just walk on water, don't they? Even when it's used as an insult like that, the implication is clear. That person is not as perfect as they think they are and certainly not as perfect as Jesus. And that is just perfect for David. Before we go too far into David, I'm gonna ask you to think about another question for a moment. Consider the people in the Bible whom you should try to emulate, or at least that you think you should try and emulate. Now we're going to exclude Jesus from this list because he should be number one on all of your lists, and I'm going to assume that's the case. But think about those people who are considered to be very holy, very good in the Bible. Who are those greatest people? Now I'm guessing that if we put a board up here and we wrote down all the names that you could shout out at me, there are some popular ones that would come out. Moses, Paul, Noah, Peter. And I'm guessing that even David from our first reading today would be on that list. And that would make a very formidable list and pretty eclectic. Yet there is one thing that all of them have in common. None of them walk on water. 
Sure, Peter got close, but he still sank. None of them were perfect. They all had at least one and likely many flaws. And the subject of our reading today, David, is often put up as one of the holiest people in the Bible. He is credited with writing at least 73 of the Psalms. He was handpicked by God and is often described as a man after God's heart. Surely, you couldn't pick somebody better than that, could you? But that is not the David we got today, is it? Instead, we got the David who sees a beautiful woman, covets her, sleeps with her despite her marriage, discovers she is pregnant, and arranges to have her husband killed in battle so that his sin might not be discovered. What a contrast between our two readings. On one hand, we have Jesus, who freely feeds 5,000 with food that we are told six months' wages couldn't afford. On the other, we have David, who steals another man's wife, despite already having six wives of his own and the ability to have any woman in the kingdom he wanted. On one hand, we have Jesus, who freely gave his own life to hide our sin and our shame. On the other, we have David, who took the life of another man to hide his own sin and his own shame. And yet we always talk about the David who was a man after God's heart. He clearly did not walk on water. And he is not alone. If we just look at that short list I mentioned a little bit ago, Moses failed to follow all of God's command and was never able to enter the promised land. Paul sought out and killed Christians before he repented. Noah abused alcohol, eventually leading to a curse upon Canaan that was used to justify slavery until the 1800s. And even Peter, the rock who had started to walk on water towards Jesus, lost his faith and sank, not just this time, but once again when he claimed three times not to know Jesus despite predicting that he would do so. These four clearly also did not walk on water. Now, I don't say these to try and get you down on your favorite Bible heroes. In fact, I do so for quite the opposite reason. I do it because we need to learn two lessons from these comparisons. First, it's okay that you don't walk on water. Neither did the greatest people in the Bible, with one notable exception. Jesus tells us that we need to forgive everyone, but too often we forget that we are included in everyone. That causes us to hide in shame. We become like Peter and fall back and lurk in the shadows. Perhaps even like Peter, we try to go back to our old lives, but Jesus won't allow it. We need to forgive ourselves for not being perfect and just keep pushing forward, trying to be. You don't have to walk on water today. You just need to believe that through Jesus, one day you will. Second, and just as important, we need to recognize that others will not be perfect either. There's a reason that our churches are not built with moats blocking the entrance. If they were, all our churches would be empty because nobody could pass the test. And if we aren't going to literally expect people to walk on water to enter our church, we need to stop acting like they should. We need to start accepting everyone and all of their faults and all of their sins into our churches before we can help them. And yes, that means accepting our own faults and our own sins into the church before we can help ourselves. And the sooner we stop acting like everything's perfect, like we are perfect, our church is perfect, our church family is perfect, the sooner we can start working towards that perfection together. We can use our strengths to help others overcome their weaknesses, and we can use the strengths of others to help overcome our weaknesses. But we can do neither until we recognize that those weaknesses exist and that others have strengths in spite of their weaknesses. After all, hospitals are not designed for healthy people. 
They are designed to find, prevent, and treat unhealthiness, and churches are no different. They are not here for the perfect. They are meant to find, prevent, and treat imperfections. And just like a hospital will never find, treat, and prevent all unhealthiness, churches will never find, prevent, and treat all imperfections. But we must try. And we can only do that when not only are all people welcome, but all people feel welcome. And then God does promise that one day, through Jesus' sacrifice, and only through that sacrifice, we all will walk on water, and our imperfections will be washed away. But until then, it's okay if you sink from time to time. Amen.